Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, Bethsaida, and they being a, yeah, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Now it's interesting because you go back to chapter 7, verse 33. We'll have a lot of scripture to look at tonight. We have the deaf and mute. And it says in 33, he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears and spit. Okay? Now he takes him out of the town. Let me get back to where it was. He takes him out of the town, not out of the congregation, out of the town. We'll get that in a moment. And when he had spit on his eyes. So here's two cases in Mark. Jesus, all right, come out of them. One out of the multitude, one out of the town, and then there's spit. Now, spit in the Bible is interesting. I think there was there was 11 verses. I mean, it would have nothing to do with, with why Jesus would have spit here. But, I mean, it was in the law, it, you know, somebody had leprosy, someone had an issue, if he spit upon you, you would be unclean a certain amount of days. Well, Jesus was, was not ever unclean. That's not the case. There's a case where it didn't happen in Ruth, but there's a case if the, the, if the older brother dies and he's left with the widow and his brother doesn't want to take the wife and carry forth the seed of the older brother and then to remove remove his shoe and the wife would have to spit on him and say this is the house the one loose of a shoe well that doesn't have to do anything to do here and it's a shame I mean somebody would have spit in and then we see the, 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 the trial from the Sanhedrin and we see all the way to the cross that they are spitting upon Jesus Christ so why in chapter 7, a man that has is, is no hearing and impotent of speech, and here's a blind man, and he spits now, then on his eyes. Now, Jesus Christ couldn't spit on his eyes. It would be his eyes. And when you read chapter 7, <laughs> who's doing what and what's doing who? <laughs> And he put his hands on him, and he asked him if he saw on. Uh. So he takes him out, and we take our Bibles to Luke. We got plenty of we got short scripture in in Mark today, but we got plenty of scriptures in the Bible. Luke chapter ten, verse thirteen. I hope. Woe unto the Chorazin! Woe unto the Bethsaida! Well, that's where they're at. For mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you. They had great wild or repented sit in sackcloth and that. So what has happened in Bethsaida? Listen, that didn't happen in Tyre. That didn't happen in Sidon. And they were destroyed. Everything's happened in Bethsaida. And when we come to chapter Mark, you know what? Jesus says, Come out of there. You know why? They're not believing. Why do you say come out of the multitude, chapter 7? Because they're not believing. And there are some cases, listen, I, I'm nobody important. But I have been pulled out of a church. I have been asked to leave a church because you know what? They don't believe. I have been called out of the street ministry in Daytona Beach, Florida, because... They don't believe anymore. And it got to the point, I was just preaching the same people over and over and over. There were no new people coming. So come out. So he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. We're going to get that in a moment. After he put his hands again on his eyes, it made him look up, and when he and he was restored, and he saw every man clearly. 
And he sent them away to his house to say, neither go into the town. Don't go back into that town. Because they don't believe. Evidently, the guy is not from Bethsaida. Don't, they're, they're not worthy. America's getting to the point, you know what? It's not a town, it's not a city, it's a country. It, it, it's going to be no more worthy. We have soiled the Bible, we've soiled Jesus Christ, we have soiled God, and you know, we're one nation under God. Well, that ain't a big G no more. But that was... Nor tell it to any in the town. So it looks like this totally, I mean, God loves everybody. God, God, Jesus Christ says, Bethsaida, I give up on you. Now, like I said, we just read, Jesus says, woe unto you. When, when, when God says woe, you better pay attention. Because it ain't good. Now, we got some scripture to look at here. Uh, where shall we go? Matthew. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew eleven twenty one, And it's the same thing. Verily, verily. Woe unto you, Kavorosin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works have been done in you, which has, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, such as was Nineveh. Everything is going on, or the thing is going on in Bethsaida. Hey, listen, that didn't happen entirely. That did not happen. You know who's from Zion, don't you? Jezebel. And with that, you had the great Elijah and Elisha walking and running about. So... It could get to the, you know, if God does such a great blessing, and God has done a great blessing on, on America long ago. You know, that's that. Um, so what we got here is, he says, I see men as trees walking, judges. Judges. Judges chapter 9, verse 6. And the Bible, through parables, which this was not a parable, through illustrations, through stories, through the dreams and all that, there is a lot to trees. And it says in verse 6, In the time the men of Shechem... Gathered together and all the house of Milo went up and made Abimelech king. Okay, here's a king. They made him king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And when they told it to, to Jonathan, that's his brother, he went and stood on top of a Mount Gezer of them, not a pulpit, not a church building. He lifted up his voice and cried and said unto him, Hearken to me, all men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. So I'm going to give you a message. And we're not going to get into all of chapter 9, but he says the trees went forth at the time appointed a king over them. All right, so he, the trees, he's likened to the men of Shechem. Trees are very well known in the Bible. Jesus speaks about, you know, if a man can be judged, the man's heart can be judged by what fruit? There are trees that produce good fruit, and there are trees that produce uh, poison, horrible, untasteful fruit, and there are trees that have no fruit at all, like in the men. Trees are created by God. Man is created by God. It's funny how they never you never hear anything about the evolution of trees. 400 million quadrillion years ago, you know, the, the oak tree used to be a, a Campbell's soup can. <laughs> And it came out of the water, and it walked on the land, and, and then it stopped to talk to to the great witch and all that. And then, you know, his trees got stuck in the mud, and now, he, you know, they're all stuck in the ground. Where's the evolution of trees? Trees were all destroyed in Noah's flood, and God purposely, during Noah's flood, replanted 
trees, not by seed, but as he did in Genesis 1, boom, there's a tree, fully grown, ready to go. You know, we got the, we, they'll say, you got the, the world's oldest, greatest tree. Well, if it is the oldest, and it could be going all the way back to Noah's floods. Now, trees have families as people have families. Trees are alive, like men. Trees die, like men. Trees have their point where, you know, they go into hibernation, like men. You know, you, you're in your dying years, and you come back to your springtime of your life, like man. You have your different family groups. You get you got your oaks, you got your elms, you got your maples, and like man. There's all different kind of races, creeds, and, and a man just like trees. There's a time of year, you know, a tree is just ugly, dead, no life. And then you got the time where it starts budding in the springtime, you know, you know, lovers come together and you know, you start budding, you start bringing forth, for, you know. Your, your leaves and your buds and flowers and all, like man. And then there's a time where, you know, you, you flower and age and you just change, your hair changes color, your beard changes color and everything like that, like man. There's a lot to treat. Matter of fact, if you were to look at the trees in the Bible and look at an encyclopedia or a, a, a bombinous book about trees, you can probably come up with tons of messages. Between tree, trees and men. And here's one in Judges chapter 9. Now Psalms. Psalms 1. It states. Blessed is the man that walketh. Not in the uncounsel of the godly. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And that's not your government. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his and his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. So what is one possibility for a tree is likened to a man that obeys God, a man that loves the Lord, a man that's planted by waters. Jesus said, I'm the water of life, and that, that, that root is put forth in Jesus. It grows and produces fruit. Because look what he said, bring it forth its fruit in its season. Then Jesus said, wherefore by their fruit you should know them. If you're producing spiritual, godly, Bible fruit, well, your roots are reaching out to the water of life. If your fruit is in the world and ungodliness and everything that the church is producing today, oh boy. His leaf also shall not wither. Well, in fall they do. You're an evergreen. Problem is, many Christians will take an evergreen tree and stick it up in defiance of Jeremiah chapter 10. Oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum, you're going to burn that tree in hell. The ungodly are not so. So, <laughs> there's a tree the ones who love the Lord and try to do right. Exodus 25. Exodus 25. 25. 13. And this is the tabernacle furniture. He says, I'll make stave of shittim wood. Shittim wood's a tree. We don't know what it is today, but it's a tree. Overlay them with, with gold. Now, gold pictures deity, royalty, king. Solomon, everything was king when it came to uh, to the temple because it was all gold. It pictures God as king. Jesus, the king of the Jews, it pictures everything of royalty, of godliness, gold. What's underneath that gold is wood, a tree. What is that? That is the human nature of Jesus Christ, the wood. And the gold, the deity of Jesus Christ as God. And a, a stave, a pole put on two put on two shoulders of men to carry the, the, the items of the furniture. And it's funny because there's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gold, the king, the tree, the wood, man. So that's that. 
Then we go to Matthew 3.10. And we can just keep on going and going all night, but we're not going to. Matthew 3.10. Look what John the Baptist says. And we'll look at verse 7. But when, so, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, their people, come to his baptism, he said, Oh, generation of vipers, what a great preacher. What would your preacher do? Oh, you got your wonderful people. How great you are. Don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> All are welcome. Not John the Baptist. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? <laughs> well, evidently, the word's getting around. <laughs> Bring forth, therefore, the fruits. 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 Meat for repentance. Think not that I'm saying within so. We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to raise these stones to raise up the children unto Abraham. Now, also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit, who is he talking to? He's talking to two classes of people. The Pharisees said, what, what do he say? Your trees. That bringeth forth not good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire which is hell. There is ungodly, unproductive fruit-bearing trees. and said, you're going to burn in the fire. The psalm said, your fruit is not going to wither. What's that? Listen, you go out there and you're a Christian. You try to win souls and, and people do get saved by some form of work that you do. Listen, you may die. That body is going to resurrect at the rapture. Listen, your fruit does not go away. There are people in heaven. Matthew seven seventeen. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither could a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast in the fire. So the questions you got to look at your life is what fruit are you producing? The church is a body of people. It's not a building. What is your fruit that you're producing? Are you producing false souls trusting Christ? Are you producing a worldly kind of evangelism that set forth by the world that all are welcome? Are you involved in paganism and, and, and all that other stuff? That's evil fruit. That's not God. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you say it. I, you cannot put forth scripture. Now, if you're going to do things right, you're going to do things godly. You're going to be able to pick up the scriptures and you're going to be able to name the chapter and verse where that is. So, it's remarkable here that, that, that Mark, like I said, Mark just focuses on Jesus and the blind man. And yet, we read the things. There is a possibility of God, Jesus, I don't care what the, what the JW said, God is Jesus. There is a possibility that Jesus would say, you know what? Excluding an individual person, excluding maybe a congregation of people, maybe a group of people, an entire city, Jesus would say, you know what? I don't want to hear. You know what God told Jeremiah in, in Jeremiah's book? It's as far as the people of Jewish, don't even pray for them. I'm not going to listen. That's a whole, that's more than a, a, a city, a group of people. That's a whole nation. God's people, guys, that don't even pray for them. And there are people out there, and listen, I pray for you unsaved and all that, but I may be praying for people, God's like, you know, they had their chance. I may be praying for a church somewhere, and God's like, no, that's just wicked. 
There may be to a point that best saver being being the example. Listen, I have multiply blessed you. I I taken care of you. I've done everything I can for you. You reject. And what's Paul say? Paul says to the Corinthian church, they could not enter in because unbelief. Rejection of what God said. That's what they outright did. There are churches today, and, and people like me, we go to those churches and say, listen, that's wrong. That's that's cannibalism. I'm not kidding. That's, that's carnalism. That, that, that's just totally wrong. That, you, that's wrong. Okay, we're going to do what we're going to do. And you got the wrong Bible. Well, that's okay. It, you know, I believe that today in the lives of seeing churches and may throughout the church history, I believe that God sends people into those churches. Says, "What are you going to do? What are you going to say? How are you going to act?" Lives of seeing church ain't doing just so good. Lives of seeing churches have seen men who do preach the truth. And yet the churches and the Christians are not doing right. And you make it to the point that God says, okay, you've got a closed door. I don't care what you say. You may think you're rich. You may think you're great. You may think you have the greatest VBS. You may think you're having revivals. You may think you're wonderful. You think everything's good and great and wonderful. And God says, you're miserable. You're naked. You're wretched. And maybe the devil is the one blessing you. See, people forget that, you know, the devil can bless you too. And that the fact is, with this man, God told him, all right, come out of this city. In chapter 7, we say, we saw God with the man who couldn't hear. He says, come out of the group of people. Those people are not going to listen. No matter what I do for those people, they're not going to believe. Here in Bethsaida, he calls the man out of the town. He says, listen, they're not going. Don't even go back there and tell them what happened. And when you get by the end of, of, of Deuteronomy going into um, Joshua, there's only two men that went into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb because they believed. And even Caleb, I think you go into the third chapter, third or fourth chapter, you go, you get into Joshua. Caleb's like, hey, Joshua, yeah, what's up? You know, God said, when we're, remember when we were 40 years old? Remember we went in here and God said, you can have that mountain. I'm an 81 year old man right now. I'm ready to go kick some giant butt. Well, how are you going to kick giant butt? God's going to do it. And God's like, I like that. You get in there, you get that mountain. What happened to everybody else? Oh, let's make a team. Let's go back to Egypt. God can't do it. God can't take care of us. God can't give us food. God can't give us water. We're going to have to go for the means of the world. And that's what Christians in the world do today. That's why there's a closed door in the line of the same church. That's why Jesus Christ is standing outside the door because unbelief. Oh, we need people to come to the church. So, you know, go tell them about the church. Go tell them about the pastor. Go tell them about this revival, but don't tell them about the gospel. Because Jesus put it plain and sure in Matthew. Preach the gospel. That ain't being done today. When I, I got Facebook and I got, I've got all kinds of people who, who have all kinds of ministries on Facebook and some are street preachers and there's videos and I, and my prayer is today is when I see something like that, because some of them are in languages I don't really understand. I say, Lord, if they're preaching the gospel, if they're preaching the right gospel and they're preaching that people need to be saved and they're not saying say this prayer, if they're doing right, Lord God bless them. And if they don't, I'm not praying for it. You say, that's wrong. What did, let's go back to Mark. I'm not there. I'm in Matthew. Mark chapter 8. And look what Jesus told him. You know, you shouldn't be like that. All right. So he takes him out. He doesn't even bring him back and say, but say it. Mark 8, 20 said, well, you should, you know. He sent the man away to his house. Evidently, he's not living in Bethsaida. He said, neither go into the town, Bethsaida, nor tell to any in the town. 
Bethsaida. That's what he told Jeremiah. Don't not about Bethsaida, but that's what he told. You. Don't pray for them, and don't you go in there and tell them nothing. Now, there's been many times I wanted to go back to the farmers market in Daytona Beach, and it's like, no, no. You did six years. Six years was long enough. And I keep praying, well, Lord, give me somewhere else. You just stay on Facebook right now and you worry about your health right now. I'll take care of you. Well, you know, God, we should pray for everybody. What's what's Mark 8, 26 say? Don't go back. They won't. Listen, and it, I'm sorry, but maybe your family. You may witness to your family. Well, I'm going to go to family union. I'm going to sit. No, don't. Aren't we called to be separate? Are we not to, you know, be partakers of the unbelievers? Yeah, I know we use that verse for, you know, finding a girlfriend or boyfriend. What about your family? I know a few families, you know, they would skip church and go to that family reunion. They're not in church no more. Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day. Don't be part of it. Witnessing is, and I forget where Paul writes, he said, abolish the heretic the first and second time, and that's it. I'm sorry, but that's it. You either, you're either planting seed or you're watering seed. And Jesus said, don't go back to that town. I know if it's your family, you love them. If it's your co-workers, you really care for their souls. Jesus also said, pray unto the Lord that the Lord will send harvesters. You may not be the harvester. You've done your part. Maybe God had to send somebody else. You see, we Christians, we get and think, we're going to do it. It's going to be all us, me. I am the light and shiny armor, and God's up in heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I see your heart. And you know, another thing I may say, it's so funny because he says, I see men as trees. Well... <laughs> There was a blind man. How do you know what trees look like? I guess you can have partial vision and still not be totally blind. But I know one thing. They brought the man to Jesus. They brought him. And they said, Jesus. It says, they brought a blind man unto him and besought him to touch. They said, Jesus, here's, he's blind. Touch him. It wasn't the blind man. It was his friends again. Remember, remember the, the four that brought their, their friend on the bed and broke open the guy's roof and dropped him down? Now, those men did not give this guy sight. The men on the roof did not make that man get up and bring his bed. We bring our friends to the gospel. Let Jesus do the healing. Let Jesus do the saving. Don't get them in. Oh, okay, we're there. Get, say this prayer. <laughs> that may not be salvation. I'm coming up on my anniversary. I was going to say uh, April 25th, 1987, I was saved. The Sunday, that was a Saturday. The Sunday before that, I for the first time went to a Baptist church. I could have been saved that Sunday. I could have been saved that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or even Saturday. I don't know exactly what moment, what time Jesus saved me, the hour and the seconds. 
But it was nobody but Jesus. There was nobody but Jesus that gave this man sight. I was blind, but now I see. It wasn't an ophthalmologist. It was Jesus. I was deaf and dumb. I don't know what doctor does that, but I know Jesus done it. Because it, because April 26, the day after I got saved, I went to my dad and said, Dad, you're going to hell. God loosed the tongue. God heard my ears open up. And there have been times in my Christian walk. Listen, I've come from Connecticut. I, I, I'm a Yankee. And there's so much I want to go back to Connecticut. I want to. I miss Connecticut. God's like, nope. I was like, well, what if I go to what if I go to Rhode Island? No. But Lord, Florida, you just stay right there. If I want you to move, I'll move you. You just stay right there. If I want to go, you have done your job. You get one of the best say that somebody. I was like, nope, don't go back there. And listen to me. Listen to me. And we're, we're done. If God tells you no, you better listen. Because we rejoice in God answered my prayer. Hallelujah. All right, God, listen. Why don't you rejoice when God says no to your prayer? Because if he would answer yes, think about all the troubles you could have got into. Think about all the all the hurt that may if God answered that prayer. What about all the, the troubles and problems and agony if God wouldn't answer that prayer? The very fact is the mercy of, and the grace of God is hard to think about. God didn't answer that prayer. Boy, I may have been in a lot of trouble. Let God be in charge. And, when, and today's thing is when he says no, no.